Hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, to my second matriarchal sermon called <laughs> Don't Talk About Men. <laughs> um, I was inspired to make this video based on a book that I picked up that I thought would be just fabulous. And you know what? It probably will be. I'm just starting it, so I'm sure it's full of wonderful information, but I read the introduction and I was inspired to make this video. So I'll read it to you and I'll and I'll explain why I am making this sermon of Don't Talk About Men. Um, here's the book. Which sounds really cool, right? Like, I mean, so much of modern medicine is is told from the male's point of view, right? We women um, of all race, uh, age, ability, um, have been left out of it. Like it, the the studies have been done on men. The men were the first allowed to practice it. Um, to this day, women go in looking for answers for their pain and suffering, and they'll be told they have hysteria. You know, so this book sounds fabulous. It it sounds great to really dive into the history of female and. We are starving for that. Like, we are starving for that. So I picked up this book, and I'll read you the the first uh, little bit of the introduction. And uh, let me know what you think in the comments, okay? So I'm just going to put it away. I've got my contacts on today, so I need to read from afar. Elizabeth Shaw has a problem. The director, Ridley Scott, has impregnated her with a large vicious alien squid aboard the spaceship Prometheus she has to find a way to abort her uninvited guest without bleeding to death shambling to a futuristic surgery pod she asks the computer for a c-section air it says this med pod is calibrated for male patients only shit the woman behind me said who does that what follows is a gruesome scene involving, involving lasers, staples, and writhing tentacles. As I sit in a darkened theater in New York in 2012, watching this prequel to Alien, I couldn't help but think, yes, who does that? Who sends a multi-million dollar expedition into space and forgets to make sure the equipment works on women? Actually, modern medicine often precisely does that. One-size-fits-all doses of antidepressants are given to men and women despite evidence that they may affect the sexes differently. Prescriptions for pain medications, too, are considered sex-neutral, despite consistent proof that some may be less effective for women. Women are more likely to die of heart attacks, even though they're less likely to have them. Symptoms differ between the sexes, so women and their doctors alike fail to catch them in time. Anesthetics and surgery, treatments for Alzheimer's, even public education curricula suffer from the ill-conceived notion that women's bodies are just bodies in general, soft, fleshy, and missing a couple of significant neither bits, but otherwise just the same as men's. Sounds great, right? Like, this is a great introduction to the book. Like, yay, we're going to talk about women. And then comes the next paragraph. Of course, nearly all the studies that produced these findings include only cisgender subjects. In the world of scientific research, there has been very little attention to what happens to the bodies of people assigned one or another excess at birth, who then go on to identify differently. In part, that's because there's a massive difference between biological sex, something wound deep into the warp and weft of our physical development from in-cell organelles all the way up to the whole body features and built over billions of years in evolutionary history. And humanity's gender identity, which is a fluid thing and brain-based and at most a few hundred thousand years old. And this is where I started to like, where's she going? 
But it's not just that. The fact of the matter is that until very recently, the study of biological female body has lagged for behind the study of the male body. It's not simply that physicians and scientists don't bother to seek out sex-specific data. It's that all too recently that data didn't exist. Well, why doesn't the data exist? Because they don't seek it out to research it. From 1996 to 2006, more than 70% of the animal studies published in the scientific journal Pain included only male subjects. Before the 1990s, the stats were more disproportionate. And this is hardly unusual. Dozens of prominent scientific journals report the same. The reason for this blind spot concerning female bodies, whether we're talking about basic biology or the nuances of medicine isn't just sexism. It's an intellectual problem that became a societal problem for a long time. We've been thinking about what sex bodies are and how we should go about studying them in entirely the wrong way. Like, is it wrong of me to just say it's pure sexism? So... Yeah, so that's the first literally two pages of the book. And she starts off really, really strong. And then she goes into the gender identity, which, you know, assign male, assign female at birth. And, um, and that is what's brought up the reason for this sermon. Can we write a book? Can we talk about women's history? Can we talk about women's health without needing to include men in our conversation, period. Why do we always have to include men? And why do we always have to include the gender identity, which is a purely social construct, which has nothing to do with biology, bio, bio, biological sex. So I don't know why she did this. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's her in person or if it's her publisher in who told her to write this in order to be more inclusive. Um, I don't know why. And I'm sure the rest of the book will be filled with wonderful, wonderful information on the history of female and health and human evolution. But why do we need to bring up the men? is what I'm talking about today. And, you know, a thought came to me when I was reading this book, like, you know, they always say we got to talk about, you know, the the transgenders, and we got to talk about, you know, the non-binary, and we got to talk about those not assigned at their sex at birth, and therefore gender fluid, or whatever language they want to use. And they say, in order to be more inclusive, well, let me ask you this. As a woman, when you're picking up a book to read about women, and they start bringing that into it, do you feel included? I sure don't. I feel excluded in my own discussion, which is the problem with patriarchal thinking. So let's make this... Let's make this matriarchal sermon number two. Let's make this one of the grounded rules of matriarchy or values or whatever you want to call it. Let's talk about females. Let's talk about women without needing to include men. After we are, after all, we are our own sex. We are the primordial sex. Men come from us, not the other way around. As I said in my first sermon, um, existence started as female. So are we not allowed, are we not deserving of our own conversation of how we came to be? So, yeah, you can tell I'm a little riled up about this. Um, that's something to think about, don't you think? 
And... When you go out into the world and you pick up books, um, you have conversations, um, you write research papers, whatever it is that you're doing, um, remember that you are allowed to center women and only women in your topics of conversation. Always. If there is a conversation that requires men, like if you're talking about men's health, well, then it makes sense to include them. But we're not. We're talking about women's evolution, or so I was told. So I'm hoping the book just had that little preamble for, you know, inclusive reasons or whatever and we'll see how the rest of the book goes I'm not gonna write her off yet I'm sure she's full of wonderful information but I am disheartened to be excited to pick up a book and within the second page being told that men are also included in the discussion Uh, yeah, I'm Laura Rose. Thanks for coming to my matriarchal sermon. I am not a guru. I'm just a woman. I am not studying at some matriarchal seminary. I'm just somebody who has went through trauma and is learning, relearning what it means to be a woman with power that was taken from her. And, um, just feel called to speak and hopefully others are called to listen. You can check me out on my website uh, www.healingfromharm.com. You can check me out on various social media sites under the title Returning to Her. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, uh, Instagram, and here. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next uh, sermon that I do. Have a good day. Bye.